Nice, nice, nice. Okay, give me an ay 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 if you saw the blimp that I hired to circle the London skies. <laughs> okay, that was a waste of 50 quid. Just kidding, it costs way more than that. Um, <laughs> uh, for the people who don't know me, which is this cluster of people over here, let me just take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Bronwyn. My parents have called me bronze medal since I was a child, and I've been fighting to be gold in their hearts ever since. <laughs> Yeah, I know, it's a bit sad, really. It's kind of a bummer. I don't know why I started there. Um, welcome to my show, Off Brand. This is a show about the power of branding. In my opinion, branding is one of the most powerful forces on the planet, after gravity, <laughs> and fighting the urge to say, oh yeah, I um, just listened to a podcast about that. <laughs> when your friends tell you anything, all right, but we're actually gonna do another little quick branding exercise while we're all here. Did anyone notice the song that played when I walked on stage? Okay, some I, I, someone over here is very keen, and, and I don't know this person. Um, I, didn't, I didn't plant her in the audience, but would you like to share with the group? The Thong Song. The Thong Song by? Cisco. Okay, now, I thought everyone would know this song, but I did this joke recently in Kent. And uh, turns out the good people of Tunbridge Wells are not familiar <laughs> with the thong song. So let's do a quick little uh, little survey. Give me an oh yeah, if you know the thong song. Oh yeah. Beautiful harmonies. <laughs> Give me an oh no, if you don't know it. Oh. Oh my god. Okay, everyone knows the thong song? Because do the people in, did someone say they don't? It's okay, there's no wrong answers no, I here. Said obviously, everyone okay. knows. You say, obviously, you would be so surprised. <laughs> uh, to this poor guy in the front row in Tunbridge Wells, I had to say, like, listen, it's not crucial for you to understand or know the thong song to appreciate the show, but all you do need to know is that in 1999, there was a rapper by the name of Cisco who realized that the words thong and song rhymed. <laughs> and a musical phenomenon was born, wasn't it? Now, the thong song is not just a catchy song with lyrics that have aged beautifully. I mean, it's pure, po did, did we all hear that? I mean, it's pure poetry, right? Like, she has dumps like a truck, truck, truck. Fast like what, what? Okay, I thought we'd all sing along, fine. All right, okay. I haven't earned your trust yet. There, you're very excited. There'll be three more opportunities to sing this song, okay? Don't you worry about that. There'll be a big finale at the end, okay? But look, the thong song is not just a catchy song with lyrics that have aged gracefully. It's also a really great example of musical marketing, right? You see, in 1999, thong sales were on the brink, okay? <laughs> Turns out people were not interested in wearing butt floss, okay? <laughs> or underwear that gave them frontal labia wedgies, also known as leggies. <laughs> I may or may not have one right now, but there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> But what happened is the thong conglomerates, AKA the conglong, conglong, glong, glongs. It's <laughs> kind of intelligent humor you can expect from me tonight. The thong conglomerates got together with Cisco, right? They wrote the thong song and you know what happened? Thong sales went through the roof. And with it, cases of thrush. <laughs> Which is why all thongs are now sold with a little tube of canister, okay? This is what is known as Vertical integration. <laughs> now look, I love branding. I'm obsessed with branding, okay? And I think it's because in my life, outside of comedy, I work in advertising. Pause for applause, no? Okay. <laughs> I'm obsessed with branding, right? Some of my friends are into murder podcasts, murder documentaries, not me. I think life is scary enough, thank you very much. I'll take a tale about a video rental company that didn't foresee the future power streaming platforms any day. <laughs> that is, of course, the story of? Blockbuster. 
Okay, good. We're all of age. Um, <laughs> when I did the show in Edinburgh, this little kid, well, he wasn't little. He was like 18, some Gen Z twat in the front row. <laughs> didn't know Blockbuster, and I was like, get out. <laughs> this show is not for you. Okay? But no. The Thong song is a great song, and uh, I am obsessed with branding. And it's not just a classy song. It's also... Uh, the final track on my funeral playlist. <laughs> Actually, there was something else I was supposed to say there. Do you mind if I just reverse out of it and pretend that never happened? Cool. What I was supposed to say is, <laughs> I'm actually really happy that you all are here because I think after Beanie Babies, time is our most valuable currency, <laughs> right? And <laughs> you all have chosen to spend your time here with me tonight and I'm forever grateful, right? You've chosen to spend your time here with me, a 30-something year old fake American, I was born in Blackpool. <laughs> Not a joke, just a fact, but thank you for laughing. A 30-something-year-old fake American whose idea of a good time is staying in and aggressively masturbating to vintage videos of 90s Italian football players. <laughs> Sorry, um, is my wank bank a little niche? It's less a wank bank, more a wank long-term cash ISA, okay? You see, the videos in there are just compounding an interest over time. And the men in those videos can, uh, Compound me anytime. Hey, oh! <laughs> Football finance wanking joke. It's what we came for. It is not. <laughs> no, but I thought by my age, I would be a lot more secure in my brand, right? At my age, my mother's brand was airtight. Connie was a no nonsense woman who loved her four children and the music and hair of Michael Bolton, okay? My <laughs> the Michael Bolton joke was a little slow there. Some people got there, right? But I don't know, my brand is a little all over the place. All I know for sure about myself is that I'm obsessed with Italian football players, looking at branding stories, and thinking about my death. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> it's a bit of an emotional gear shift. Just stay with me, right? I do think about my death a lot, and I think it's because when I was 13, I had my very first crippling panic attack. <laughs> I had panic attacks before they were cool, all right? It was a doozy. I thought I was gonna die. And the three things that got me through that moment were Italian footballers, flicking the bean, and the thong song. <laughs> you see, when it happened, I was visiting my cousins in the UK, right, and I was sleeping in the living room, and I couldn't fall asleep because of this panic attack. So I turned on the TV, and I put on Channel 4, and there's a program on there called Football Italia. Does anyone remember Football Italia? Yeah. Yes, I think we were watching it a little differently, unless you're into Italian footballers, which, I mean, it's great. All I know is I had never seen men this beautiful in my entire life, right? You gotta remember, it's 1999, the hottest guy I'd ever seen was uh, Prince Eric from The Little Mermaid and uh, <laughs> Justin Timberlake in his pot noodle hair era, right? <laughs> so there I was, quietly humping a pillow in a Bob the Builder sleeping bag. <laughs> Bob the Builder, can he fix it? No, he could not. <laughs> The only CD I had in my disc man was the thong song, which I played over and over and over again. Okay, so it's not just a song with great lyrics or a great song to listen to when you're coping with a panic attack. It is also the final track on my funeral playlist. Yeah, we got there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else here have a funeral playlist? Okay, cool, sweet, one person. Um, you know what they say, always start your shows with your most relatable material, right? I'm guessing if no one here has a funeral playlist, you've also never written your own obituary for fun? I have. Got a file on my desktop titled, Oh Bitch, You Wary. All right, yeah. I think I was a bit of an emo teenager growing up when all my friends were planning their dream weddings. I was like, do you guys think my pallbearers could carry my casket, but still pop it like it's hot, pop it like it's hot? Mm. <laughs> Only thing popping there were my knees. That was not worth it. Um, no, that was terrible. No, I think the real reason I've got a funeral playlist is I come from a very big family, okay? I never got to play my music growing up. And I feel like the afterlife would be my only chance to control the aux cable. And I just really like the idea of forcing my family to sit through an emotionally confusing playlist of my favorite songs. I want them to have to sit there and listen to the Gladiator theme song, followed by Hakuna Matata. In fact, I don't even think I'd get them to listen to songs I liked in life. As my final joke, I want my family to have to sit there and try to cry to Mambo Number no. 5. 
a song I really hated growing up, but I was always really jealous that my name wasn't listed in it. Until <laughs> I listened to it recently, like, those lyrics are creepy as fuck. I don't want to be one of Lou Bega's women. <laughs> Terrible song, right? But I don't just have a funeral playlist. I've got the whole day planned out, starting with Save the Dates, all right? <laughs> I'm going to send out Save the Dates to all my friends. But instead of a date, it's just going to say TBD to be determined, to freak everyone out. Mostly, I just want my married friends to have to keep a fridge magnet with my face on it for once, right? I've pre-booked the hot priest from Fleabag because the theme of my funeral is horny. It'll be like the fucking Met Gala, which is why I've also hired 20 hot male models to sit in the front two rows just looking sexy and mysterious. Everyone will think they're my past lovers. <laughs> Everyone will think that. I don't know why you laugh so hard at that. No one will have to know that I sent out the saddest email in the history of emails to some booker at modelsareus.com backstroke funerals. <laughs> just so we all know, my funeral playlist is available exclusively on Spotify. Um, just look for death jams. <laughs> right now, it's just me and my mom. It's very sad. Please follow it. <laughs> now... In my job in advertising, in my day job, I'm a very different person. I'm very career driven, I'm very motivated. I can't believe I get paid to write, it's amazing. And I'm very good at my job, right? I once got paid to write the sentence, what is the word impossible? But the words, I'm possible. <laughs> for a tampon brand. <laughs> I once worked on a jingle for a luxury dog mansion brand. Diva dogs where dogs live better than humans. <laughs> ba -da -ba -ba -ba. I hate myself. <laughs> but I've been working in advertising for so long because I like earning money, all right? Anyone who tells you that money cannot buy happiness has never lived in London <laughs> and shared a house with Gary G, who labeled his eggs, okay? I like earning money and I like selling things. And I was convinced my whole career that I could sell anything until I downloaded a dating app for the first time in my life this year and realized I don't know how to sell myself, okay? I don't know how to package up all of this into a neat little hinge profile. Where's the prompt that lets me explain to people I've got an American accent, but I'm not American. And I look like a camp counselor who teaches kids about consent through rap. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what's my USP? What's my unique selling point, right? That I diddle it to Italian football players and think about my death when I'm bored? <coughs> Not unique enough, some might say. <laughs> and that was the inspiration for the show, you know? I wanted to take all the things that I had learned working for some of the most beloved brands on the planet. Philip Morris, Shell. No, <laughs> I haven't worked for them. I wanted to take all the things that I'd worked working on some of the most successful brands on the planet and I wanted to apply them to myself. Because what I've learned in my 15 years of working in advertising is that to be successful, you need to nail four things about your brand. This is a bit where you should probably take some notes. Are we taking notes? Okay, cool. Can't really see anyone. All right, for your brand to be successful, you need to have a cool name, a tone of voice. You need to identify your target audience and your visual identity. When those four things come together, you get a super brand like Nike. When you don't, you get Apollo Apparel. Do we all remember Apollo Apparel? Exactly, their branding sucked. <laughs> so we're gonna go on a branding adventure together because knowledge is adventurous. Are you ready to go on this branding journey with me? Yeah! yeah! All right, all right, who remembers point one of the branding adventure? I just said it. Name. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for paying attention. Um, I really appreciate it. It was name. She wins nothing, but my respect. <laughs> Your brand needs a cool name that people like to say, right? Google, Coca-Cola, <laughs> Greg's. <laughs> as I said earlier, my name is Bronwyn, or as my autocorrect would say, brown sauce. <laughs> Starting to feel a little rude and impersonal after all these years. Thought these phones were supposed to be smart. But I think people are always a little bit surprised when they see my name in emails and government forms, and then all of this shows up in real life. And I think it's because with a name like Bronwyn Cleona Sweeney, they're expecting a pale Welsh chambermaid <laughs> 
from a period drama. You know the kind is naive and northern, and we know that she's naive because she's northern. <laughs> and she sleeps with the Lord of the Manor. She gets pregnant, she gets syphilis or scurvy or some other old timey disease. It's totally preventable by eating some fucking fruit. And she dies. Whereas I'm more the sassy sidekick friend in a Netflix holiday rom-com that was clearly filmed in the summertime. <laughs> who tells her best friend Stacy, listen, if going home for the holidays doesn't make you brave enough to tell Jake how you really feel by running through airport security in heels and not getting shot like I would, <laughs> then nothing will. I'm gonna go pursue this lazy side story with the other ethnically ambiguous B-plot character. Reductive catchphrase, bye! <laughs> Actually, I would watch that movie. Sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> That's the blur for the upcoming Netflix film, Busy Businesswoman, Wholesome Hometown Hunk. <laughs> it's a real will they or will they. The front cover is just the two leads standing back to back. She's in heels, because heels mean business. He's wearing a flannel shirt, and I'm in the corner doing this. <laughs> Looking all sassy and pointless. <laughs> I love that when my Irish father and Zimbabwean mother were naming me, they were like, you know what? We don't think her life will be confusing enough. <laughs> Let's give her a Welsh name. <laughs> Keep her humble. I don't even mind being called brown sauce now, right? I don't care. I'm a huge fan of, brown, of HP brown sauce. Any other sauce heads in the audience? Any other HP brown sauce fans? We're called Sauce Heads, that's the collective name. Yeah, I love HP Brown Sauce, I like it, and I'm not just a fan because of its delicious versatility, but I do feel like a confusing sauce with ingredients that doesn't make any sense, but it's just great and you can't really put your finger on it, right? I love HP Brown Sauce, but the one thing I really love about it is, say it with me, contradictory branding. Yes, I knew you were. <laughs> I feel like you were gonna say it, but you just were like, ah, I'm a bit, I'm a bit shy. <laughs> It's the contradictory branding. HP Brown Sauce has got some nerve. It's got the confidence and packaging of an upper class condiment, right? HP stands for Houses of Parliament, which I only just learned. Yeah, it does. Did you just learn that? That is outrageous. Thank you, I know. I just, I've been eating brown sauce since I came out of the womb. And you know what? There's a picture of Parliament on the bottle. When I learned that, I, it's all right, but I mean, look, I, I learned it recently and I realized in that moment, I can be very smart in certain areas of my life, but also very dumb. I am smart dumb as opposed to dumb smart. Do we know the difference? I'll give an example, right? I was smart enough to skip a grade in school growing up, but I'm dumb enough to believe in astrology and crystals. <laughs> I believe the free stone that I got with my book on manifesting is gonna change my life. <laughs> Do we all know what manifesting is? Yeah. yeah, it's the adult version of writing a letter to Santa. <laughs> right? But no, HP Brown Sauce has got some nerve, right? Acting all confident and shit. We all know it's a working class garnish, okay? <laughs> the bottle shapes is British icon, but it's made in the Netherlands, right? HP Brown Sauce wants you to believe you're getting the official sauce of politicians. The sauce wants you to forget you're eating a sausage that's technically 4% meat. HP <laughs> brown sauce, the sausage you're eating is mostly just hoofs. <laughs> but this is the power of branding, all right? This is the power of branding. The story we put out to the world versus our story within, our packaging versus our sauce, okay? And you know what? Branding used to be reserved for products, but now in 2023, people are products. Everyone's just walking around trying to sell themselves, to find love, to find jobs, to find themselves. I saw a girl on TikTok the other day teaching people how to blow up their brands. She was 10. <laughs> Better believe I was taking notes. <laughs> I was like, yep, yep, this all sounds super legit, Carly 2013. Oh my God, amazing. Wow, it's so cool. Um, you know, my name though, I told you, is Bronwyn Cleona Sweeney. Uh, Bronwyn is Welsh for fair-chested. Thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> Cleona is Gaelic for shapely, and Sweeney is Irish for pleasant. So I believe the modern day translation of my name is, she's got dumps like a truck, 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 that's like what, what? No one wants to sing this song with me. I thought you were in, but no, okay, don't worry. 
two more opportunities, okay? <laughs> two more opportunities coming up. And that is name everyone. Who remembers the second point in our branding adventure? I'll lick your face if you remember. Oh, boy. oh shit. Okay. <laughs> I uh, may have oversold that a little. I work in advertising. Oh my God, and I've just oversold something and lied? <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, yes, it is tone of voice. T-O-V. This is how your brand talks. This is how your brand sounds. That's why if a brand wants to be trustworthy, they always have a northern accent, right? Because as we all know, Nothing bad has ever happened in the North. <laughs> Every Northern person who's ever existed ever is wholesome, honest, simple, poor. <laughs> now, I should explain my tone of voice very quickly. Um, I know I kind of touched on it earlier with Blackpool. Um, I've got the American accent of someone who studied American accents. Fucking nailed it. <laughs> Graduated summa cum laude as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> This is just the default volume on American accents. I don't know how to restore myself back to factory settings, okay? I'm like the Aldi version of an American. You think you're getting an authentic product, but if you look at the packaging a little closely, you realize like the ingredients are all a little off. Pretty sure it says Americant. I'm a fake American. I'm the human equivalent of I can't believe it's not butter. Why do I keep comparing myself to sauces and spreads? <laughs> There's something Freudian there. We, we simply don't have the time to get into it. That's a whole different show. But no, I feel like the human equivalent of I can't believe it's not butter because this accent is actually the product of growing up in Blackpool, Darlington, Athens, Orlando, Rome, Madrid, Atlanta, and London, which I know sounds like a very cool list of cities, but living through all those moves felt like being on tour with a really shit cover band, <laughs> right? I think the term for someone like me is a third culture kid, TCK. These are kids who were born in countries other than that of where their parents are from and grew up in other countries. Are there any other TCKs in the audience? Yeah. Okay, what, just a couple of us, right? How's your identity crisis going? It's all right. You haven't picked up stand-up comedy yet, so you're doing all right. <laughs> I've always been really jealous of people with hometowns. Like, I also want to go back to the small hometown that I grew up in and pretend I'm better than everyone else for leaving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every time I moved though, I would try to rebrand myself as someone different to make friends and you know, meet people at my new school. Like I remember when my family moved to Florida, a place where a man once had sex with a dolphin, he claims seduced him. <laughs> so don't know why I was trying so hard to impress the good people of Florida. Do we all know what a weird place Florida is? Does everyone know this now? Okay, cool. Um, not everyone knows it. Um, I mean, if you want to know what kind of place Florida is, know that the band Nickelback are from Florida. No, they're Canadian, but they've got real Florida energy, don't they? <laughs> when I moved to Florida, it was the first time I ever experienced cultural whiplash. Moving from Greece to Florida, the place where democracy was born to where it died. Yeah, you know. But I remember getting to my high school in Orlando. The kids there had never heard of Blackpool. So I just straight up lied about it. Remember my crush, I think his name was Jaden or Brayden or Mac or Zach or Brody or Cody or Miles or Style. I love American names. And he was like, oh my God, brown sauce. You from England? Did you know the queen? And I was like, yeah, yeah, definitely the queen. Uh, yeah, uh, Blackpool is this super posh city for the mega rich. Uh, the royals go on holiday there all the time. Yeah, we used to next door to the queen. He used to wave at her every morning. Hi, yeah, she's so nice. Um, yeah, my dad was in MI5. He's a spy, which top secret. Don't tell anyone. Um, does this make you like me more? Okay, great. Yeah, Dustin or Justin, whatever your name is. Um, the accent, very authentic Blackpool accent. Yeah, um, just don't Google it. Don't. Google it. When you Google Blackpool, the first thing that comes up is, why do people go to Blackpool? <laughs> Rude, no, I love Blackpool. But the problem with growing up around so many different accents is my voice does that thing where it takes on the accent, wherever it is I'm talking to. I believe the scientific term is called mirroring. I think most people call it being a patronizing dick. <laughs> like I was walking around, actually not far from here, central London a couple months ago, and I helped these tourists from New York who were lost. And it's amazing how quickly my accent went from Good Samaritan to Goodfellas. <laughs> I was like, oh, so what you want to do is you want to get off the subway and come and got on a walk to Leicester Square. Yeah, people don't realize it's faster. Hey, bada bing, bada boom, New York stereotypes, go Yankees. <laughs> there are no New Yorkers in, right? 
So no one can verify if that was a good <laughs> I think it was great, you know? I was also transported back to 1945 with Joe Pesci. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to date when you've got an accent mirroring problem. I tried to go out with a guy from Sydney. I think his name was Jono or Robin or Jezzo or Leza. Again, any Australians in? Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Do you guys know Jono? <laughs> Jono was from, I can't, I'm just, it's happening already. Jono was from Sydney and uh, we went out for a little while. And I remember one night things were getting intimate in the bedroom. Ooh. <laughs> I'm so sorry, just being near Australians and like my accent starts to change. One night, it went a bit Kiwi. Are you Kiwi? No, he just wanted to call me out in front of all my friends. Thank you so much. You know where it's being filmed, right? Can we cut that out in the edit? Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, I will try not to do a Kiwi. Jono was like, you know, we were in bed one night and he was like, oh yeah, you like that? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm loving it, hapes. <laughs> Which was not hot for either of us. <laughs> Australians, how was that? All right. You're not, you're not convinced, but... Um, I tried, okay? <laughs> and look, I don't just mirror accents. I pronounce words in their original accents so I can remind people how worldly I am. I'm like that annoying friend of yours who studied in Spain. I was never able to say the word chorizo <laughs> the same way again without the flourish of a Spanish guitar, right? Yeah, you guys know I studied in Barcelona, right? Um, yeah. The, uh, Locals introduced me to this gorgeous Rioja. I was drinking the plaza with my amigos. It was so um, especial. That's Spanish for special. But when I lived in Madrid, I learned the hard way that being able to mimic an accent does not actually make you fluent in a language. <laughs> Who knew? I've been in Madrid about a week. I thought this made me an official local. When I, I was out with some friends, got a bit drunk, went into a store to get more supplies. Picked up this gorgeous bottle of Vino Blanco from this cute little indie vineyard, Casilla del Diablo. Um, you guys are probably not really... Instantly dropped it on the floor. It spilled everywhere. It was very embarrassing. I went up to the woman at the till and I said, Lo siento, estoy embarazada. She didn't really react in a way that I thought was appropriate local to local. So I bought more wine and a pack of cigarettes, lit one on the way out. Now, anyone here who speaks Spanish knows that what I actually said was, I'm sorry, I'm pregnant. <laughs> Not a day goes by that I don't think about that baby. <laughs> I could never have had. <laughs> but the one place where I truly learned the power of tone of voice was in Rome. You see, after years of wanking, watching Football Italia, <laughs> my little innocent uh, crush on the footballers turned into a full-blown obsession by the time I was 17. And there was one player in particular who I was obsessed with. His name was Alessandro Del Piero. Does anyone know this guy? Yeah? Fucking great, still love him, right? This whole show is so I can meet him. <laughs> but after years of watching Football Italia, what I realized I had to do if I wanted to meet him was I wanted to move to Italy so I could become a football journalist and meet him and marry him, right? I was convinced this was how it was gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> classic story, right? We all did this, right? <laughs> we all had weird panic attacks and formed weird obsessions on Italian football players who we wanted to fuck, but also respected. <laughs> for being one of the most prolific forwards of his generation. With his almost psychic ability to predict goal opportunities and always with an elegant finish. Okay. <laughs> but I got to Rome, right? And the first thing I had to do was learn the language. So I got a job at this cute little local, like, trattoria, this little mom and pop place, um, Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> now, working on Hard Rock was great, because Hard Rock is another great example of contradictory branding, right? Because nothing says rock and roll! Like overpriced hamburgers and Shakira shirts selling in the rock shop. But I liked working at Hard Rock because the clientele at Hard Rock Rome mostly fell into three categories. Okay, it was mostly relieved Americans, confused Italians, drunken Brits, right? And I just got to move between my different tones of voice depending on who was at my table, right? Like I remember serving Americans, this group of guys from Kentucky, this guy called Hank, sat down at my table in Rome and said, finally, some real food. <laughs> But Americans tipped well, I loved it. Then I would serve with the Italians. Nothing helps you learn Italian faster than explaining to a group of people from Milan, home to simple ingredients cooked beautifully, what loaded nachos are. <laughs> Hi, um, I know that you guys invented pesto, but can I interest you in this plate of deep fried corn chips 
topped with refried beans, salsa, jalapenos, refried beans, more salsa, soured cream, guacamole, and served with the signature hard rock cocktail, the hurricane, which is called that because it's like a storm on your insides. Bon appetito. But then I would serve the Brits, and I loved serving British people because all they wanted was for someone to condone getting pissed at lunchtime. <laughs> oh, hi, Sue. I think you'll find these onion rings paired beautifully with the house wine. P no, P yes. <laughs> what in Rome, Sue? It's 11.59, Sue. <laughs> Slow your roll, Sue. But you know, um, one year, my sister and I went to the same university because back in the day, we were kind of like a two-for-one deal. We did everything together. I think our parents thought it was safer if we studied abroad together, even though it was a bit more like the drunk leading the drunk. And one year, MTV came to our university because they were hosting the Video <laughs> Music Awards that year, and they were looking for seat fillers. So, you know, when the camera scans an audience, you can't have empty seats, like, now. And <laughs> <laughs> they came to recruit students, right? And I couldn't go that night because I had an accounting exam. <laughs> Rock and roll. <laughs> but my sister went. And do you know who she sat next to? The Pope. No, just kidding. MTV didn't have that kind of power. <laughs> Del Piero. She sat next to Del Piero. <laughs> I still have not forgiven her um, for that moment. We haven't spoken in uh, 15 years now. Um, oh my God, time is flying. I'm having so much fun. Are you guys having fun? Yeah. All right, we're doing okay. Because let's move on to the third. What? I didn't hear anything. What'd you say? Oh, shy now, are we? <laughs> I'm like, quickly, turn the light on this person. Wait, what did, wait, no, I like your enthusiasm. What did you say? Oh, I can't. Where is it coming from? What'd you say, bro? Oh, cute. Aw. I mean, you're wrong, but you were close. You were right. Demographic is right. Are you one of the Aussies? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, let's go. No, no, I lost it. I lost it. I didn't have it, but I lost it. But thank you so much. <laughs> no, I love your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Um, you are correct. The third one is demographic. You get the points. It was target audience. You know what I mean? But yeah, same thing, same thing. Target audience, right? Do we all remember that? Yeah. Be like this guy, okay. Target audience, when I started working in advertising, I realized very quickly that no one was my target audience because it turns out no one likes ads. Did we all know this? I couldn't wait to work in advertising and make ads that people wanted to watch, but turns out no one cares, all right? <laughs> the way I have to explain my job to people is I'm the one making the videos on YouTube you don't want to watch <laughs> before the videos that you do. And I am fully aware that it is the longest five seconds of your life <laughs> when your hand is hovering over that skip button. There's some shit that took me months to make. Sometimes even years. It's just crying out for five seconds of your time and respect. I know I'm like the online version of someone asking you for money on the street. You just want to enjoy your lunch break, watch a bit of YouTube. You want to watch a video on, I don't know, how to get abs in a week before your holiday with an illegal juice cleanse. And then I pop up, but I'm like, hey, how's it going? Hi there, hi, can I just get five seconds of your time? <laughs> I couldn't help but notice you're trying to watch a video on how to get abs in an impossible amount of time. Can I interest you in this American Peloton ad that was lazily adapted for a British audience? <laughs> no one's flat looks like that here. No, that's okay. We've also got this really great banking ad. It uses horses as a metaphor for your money literally running away from you. <laughs> no, no interest in those things? Well, thanks so much for your five seconds today. Good luck with the ads. Sometimes when I see those horse banking ads, I feel a little sorry for the old school banks. I said a little sorry, not a lot sorry. Because you know Nat West and Lloyds and Barclays, they're all out here trying to compete with the pretty young digital banks, right? And you see them getting more and more desperate in their advertising, it's so much fun to watch. They're always like, hey everyone, remember us? We're your parents' favorite bank. And we got 24-7 we got telephone banking. Aw. And telephones. <laughs> Who's gonna tell them? We've got great mortgage deals. And millennials and Gen Zers are like, fuck that, we want pink cards. <laughs> we want hot, coral, pink cards. And we want games on the banking apps. <laughs> Who here is Monzo? You. <laughs> Did you guys know that Monzo came with games? No. Hours of entertainment. 
<laughs> My favorite game is the one where you try to move money from your savings pot into your current account. <laughs> as fast as you can. <laughs> so you don't get declined buying four chicken nuggets. <laughs> After a really bad hinge date. <laughs> oh, what fun we have. <laughs> I will never own property. <laughs> At one of the lowest points in my career, and there were many, I once tried to skip past my own ad. I was like, ugh, can a girl just enjoy her morning wank to Joe Wicks, the body coach? I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk about wanking, so I don't know why I do this, I don't know, I don't know. And like, it's so great to see so many people from work in the crowd. Um, I'll see you all at the HR meeting on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Can a girl just enjoy her morning wank, Joe Wicks, the body coach? Even though she has no intention of doing these exercises, who made this trash? Oh shit, it's me. <laughs> Killing my own lady boner for the car insurance ad that uses a bunch of talking, racist rodents. <laughs> nice. Those meerkats are racist. There, I said it. <laughs> but if there's anything advertising people love more than a northern accent in a bank ad, it's target audiences, demographics. They love it, right? We love to group people into target audiences. I was once sitting in a meeting and we were working on a campaign for a very sexy product for heartburn and indigestion. I did say sexy. And the person leading the meeting told us that our target audience, our demographic, were 18 to 35 year olds. 18 to 35. Now I don't know about you, but me at 18 versus me at 35, not the same person. 18 year old me could go into Tesco and see two yellow stickers on a bacon prawn chicken sandwich, the kind that's been in a broken refrigerator all day just getting all musty. I would see that sandwich at 18 and think, bargain. <laughs> Dinner, sorted. I'll buy two. 35 year old me would see that sandwich for what it really is, which is guaranteed explosive diarrhea. 18 year old me could go on a night out with a pocket full of dreams, two pounds in a bank account, no coat in winter. Say some stupid shit like, let's just see where the night takes us. <laughs> 35-year-old me would not go out without a clear exit strategy, right? <laughs> Knowing full well the only place the night is taking me is home and in bed by 10 o'clock. So I can fall asleep to a show I've already seen a hundred times. It is almost my bedtime now, and I know eight ways to get home from here tonight. <laughs> I will be watching Frasier at 11 p.m., right? 18-year-old virgin me once told my mother I had a stomach ache, and the tone in which that woman asked me if I was pregnant was truly terrifying. 35-year-old single me told my mother that my period was a couple days late because of my lazy eggs, and the tone in which that woman asked me if I was pregnant was so hopeful. <laughs> I think she thought we'd raise that baby together, alone in the woods, <laughs> like some shitty American sitcom. Two ladies and a baby. <laughs> Coming this winter to Disney Minus. No, I would not watch that. I did enter a new target market, a new demographic this year. I turned 37. A few sad woos is worse than no woos, okay? Those were pity woos if I've ever heard any, okay? Listen, I know 37 is not old, but if a comedian tells you that they're older than 35, the only acceptable way to respond is to gasp dramatically and ask them how they look so young. So can we please try that again? Okay, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> This guy is like so ready, I love it. Okay, in a moment, okay, right, you'll get your moment. It was my birthday, I turned 37 this year. <gasps> and? Oh my God. Thank you so much for asking me, um, totally unprompted. Um, my beauty regime is very simple. It can be summed up in two words, no children. <laughs> Apply liberally in the morning, a little bit at night, Mwah. no wrinkles. Effective and free, right? But a lot of my friends, they don't like getting older. They've been complaining about getting older, especially now that like, it's harder to find our age online. You gotta like, the wrist has gotta like scroll really hard to find the 80s, you know what I mean? And our little old wrists can't handle it. All my friends are like, ugh, take me back to my 20s when I was so young and carefree. Not me, fuck my 20s. Eating double yellow sticker sandwiches for dinner. I love getting older. Going to the gym and spin class is the new club. I love cycling to nowhere. <laughs> to songs I used to get drunk to. <laughs> Brunch is the after party. Manny's, Petty's, after after party. You know what my new favorite drug is? Canceled plans. <laughs> 
Who needs drugs? <laughs> when you can experience the sheer euphoria of those magical words popping up on your screen. Sorry, mate. Gonna have to cancel. <laughs> if I could take the words, don't hate me, but dot, 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 pulverize them and snort them up my nose, I would. <laughs> cancel plan should be classified as class A drugs. A for adults. Now, if you're looking for another uh, similar high, but the come down's kind of different, may I suggest the canceled meeting? You take that shit on a Friday, you could be high all weekend. <laughs> all right, the people with jobs got that. <laughs> but all my friends who are getting older think that they've got the secret to eternal youth, and that is dating younger guys. A lot of my friends have started dating younger guys. They're like Brownman. Come on in, the water's warm, all right? <laughs> they were like, you gotta get on the dating apps and you gotta date younger guys. Now, let me specify, these men are all of legal age. Um, I'm making us sound like a bunch of witchy pedos. <laughs> but, like, but like I said up top, I have no interest in digital dating. It doesn't really appeal to me, right? I've avoided it my whole adult life, okay? Personally, I like the thrill of forming a crush in real life, okay? Harboring it from a safe distance, never acting on it getting friend zoned and then getting, introducing the guy to his future wife and getting asked to do a speech at their wedding, right? Like, you just don't get that on Hinge. <laughs> but I did it, downloaded a dating app and I opened up my age bracket to 10 years younger. And what can I say? My milkshake brought all the boys to the yard, okay? But dating young is all fun and games until you wake up at Finn's house in deep South London. That's Finn with a Y. <laughs> Finn lives in a house with eight other people there's no living room, just four bedrooms, which you learn as you try to creep out of there in the wee hours of midday when they're all still asleep. You ask Finn if he's got a spare towel, and he says his only towel, singular, is in the wash. So there you are, patting yourself dry with kitchen paper, okay? You gotta wipe yourself with the last little fleck of toilet paper left on the loo roll, okay? You look over in the shower, there's a loofah that looks like a tumbleweed. All right, the toothbrush heads look biblical. Bristles just parted like the Red Sea. Worst part of that story is Finn ghosted me. Sorry, no, when you get ghosted by a younger guy, it's called getting Caspered, actually. Uh, <laughs> my great-grandmother in Zimbabwe used to walk eight miles to a well to get water to feed her children. My grandmother in Ireland had seven kids at my age and she knitted all of them jumpers from wool. She sheared herself from a sheet if that's where Will is from, right? <laughs> I think those women walked so I could run out of the house of some guy called Jalen, who I met on Hinge, who described himself as creative director of his own brand. <laughs> Thinks a disc man is another name for a DJ. <laughs> yeah. I will not be dating younger anymore. And you know, not having kids at 37 means I have entered what I like to call the confused question head tilt phase of my life. You know, they're like, no kids. What are you gonna do? You know? And look, it's not that I don't want kids. I just thought I'd have them the good old fashioned way, right? My best friend Stacy would die tragically running somewhere in heels, right? I would get a knock at the door in the middle of the night and I would open it looking unnecessarily fashionable for such a late night house visit. <laughs> There'd be a social worker there with a baby in a basket and she'd go, are you brown sauce Sweeney? <laughs> well here, take her. She's yours now. You're the only family this kid's got, which would be totally plausible in the fantasy. And I'd say, but Eunice, her name is Eunice, I don't know why. I can't take on the burden of this child. I, don't, I can't, I've just bought this flat in London with all white carpets. It's a fantasy, okay? I go, I, I just don't have time to be a mother, not with this healthy rotation of hot young sexual partners coming through the flat. It's, it's a fantasy, okay? I go, I really can't take on the burden of motherhood right now, not since I've got this job as a female late night talk show host. It's a fantasy, okay? But over time, the seeds of motherhood would grow and me and the child would bond to some weepy cover version of You Make My Dreams Come True by Hall and & Oates. And by the end of the montage, I'd have to ask myself, did I save the kid or did the kid save me? <laughs> that, or I could just shack up with a divorced guy with kids. Like, I'm swimming in the divorce pool now and I got, I got big stepmother energy, huge. <laughs> But the kind of like stepmom, like, like Julia Roberts in the movie Stepmom, like where the kids end up loving me more than their bio mom. You know what I mean? Not the kind of like stepmother, like Disney villain who like locks the kids in a tower, gaslights them into doing chores and the father dies. But speaking of turning into a bitter evil sea witch, I did fulfill a lifelong dream this year of moving into a place on my own. Thank 
you. That is the correct response. No, it's a dream come true, actually. I'm not going to lie. I'm really happy living on my own. Um, I think after years of living with passive-aggressive flatmates like Gary G, who labeled his eggs, or Imogen S's, who soaked their pots for days, when we both know she was never going to wash that pot, right? <laughs> Weird ex-boyfriends who make you feel bad about leaving a little bit of hair in the drain like their nuclear shit didn't render the bathroom uninhabitable <laughs> for hours. Oh no, you found a used contact lens on the carpet? You licked my butthole last night, chill. <laughs> All right. See you at the HR meeting. <laughs> But you know, it's a dream, it's, it's, you know, it really has lived up to, to my fantasies living on my own, right? I love it so much, but there's one thing that I wasn't prepared for living on my own. Actually, does anyone here live alone? I, I, I realize in London it's, okay, there's a few of us, okay. Do we love it? I love it. It's great, right? Now, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but I will ask you this, because I don't know, who, who's your internet provider? There's a, pro oh no. Now to, okay, fine, he's gotten shy, it's fine. Um, no, the only reason I ask is because the one thing I wasn't prepared for is I had to call up BT myself to grant myself access to watch porn. Right? You, you can't do it on the app. You can't do it on the app. No one prepared me for that moment, right? Like teen Bronwyn dreamed of living on her own. She did not dream of talking to a guy in a call center in Birmingham to grant herself access to deepfakedelpieradick.com. <laughs> Which I realized was a weird place to end that section. <laughs> All right, point four, everyone. Who remembers, oh, actually, let's not, okay, do you remember point four? Ah, you were like, I tapped out at three. Okay. Did I, didn't Google the porn thing. What do you mean? Oh, really? Do you know what comedians love is when audience members get bigger laughs than they do, so thank you so much. No, it's all right. I mean, I don't. I, don't, I mean, I don't. I don't need to watch it anymore. It's all good. Um, I've got. I've got my Joe Wicks videos. It's fine. The last point of the branding adventure is, of course, say it with me: visual identity. Oh, we got that. That was the harmony on that was really. That's really why I get out of bed every morning. Um, visual identity, right? This is what your brand looks like. This comes down to killer packaging, a sick logo, right? It's very important. All right, visual identity is so important. It's how a brand like Lint Chocolate convinces everyone that they're a super classy product for super classy people. Do we know Lint Chocolate? Yeah. Have we ever had a Lint Chocolate ball? Yeah. They're filthy as fuck, right? <laughs> They're not classy at all, okay? I file Lint Chocolate Ball ads under my favorite category of advertising, which is food ads for horny women, all right? These are ads for things like chocolate, ice cream, Diet Coke, things that are metaphors for sex. Okay, and the Lint Linger Taco Ball ad is the best example of it. I can't believe they're allowed to show this shit on TV before 10 o'clock, okay? I'll give you a quick recap. So the ad opens with a super hot master chocolatier who, sorry to break it to you, is not a master chocolatier in real life. He's a model who was formed from the juices of a woman's wet dream. But in the ad, we see the hot master chocolatier as he seductively spoons melted chocolate in a bowl. Mm. Right? Then he tantalizes us with his big whisk, lifting molten caramel up at the screen. Right? Then we cut to a woman who is at home, alone, obviously, Googling how to watch porn around, yeah, okay. She bites into the ball of chocolate, out oozes the caramel, which is his jizz. Okay. And then we cut to the tagline, which says, Lint Lindor Master Chocolatiers, making your wife come since 1845. <laughs> Delicious advertising. That's also my parents' favorite joke. <laughs> no, just kidding, they've never seen this show. I can't, I can't let them hear me say jizzy chocolate balls to strangers, like, at all. But my parents are partially responsible for my visual identity. People get a lot more excited about my heritage than I do. They're always like, oh my god, half Irish, half Zimbabwean, what a cool mix, I love your skin tone. Like my skin is some kind of cotton poly blend that breathes well in the summertime. I mean, look, it does tan beautifully. And I like being mixed race, or as Americans say, biracial, like I'm just going through a phase. <laughs> but how a product shows itself matters, right? Packaging matters. And as someone who works in advertising, I should be immune to sexy packaging, but I don't care. I buy a lot of stupid shit. Like uh, after years of watching Joe Wick's videos, I was very inspired for about four minutes and I got a very heavy kettlebell which is now just a very heavy doorstop. <laughs> the door is not closed in like four years now, right? 
Another point, an ad followed me around the internet and convinced me to buy a weighted blanket for my anxiety. Anyone else get one of those? I got it in the heaviest one, like setting I could get. I think it was called crushing, <laughs> right? But then I bought an electric blanket for the bottom of my bed, which was emotionally confusing, but also very erotic. <clears throat> but the stupidest thing that I spent my money on was a 16 setting vibrator called the Clit Annihilator. <laughs> Now, it's not actually called that, but I will not do their advertising for them for free. If anyone here is interested in clit annihilation, please speak to me after the show. <laughs> I call this thing the clit annihilator, though, because technically it's not a vibrator. This thing should be classified as a power tool. Okay? It's so powerful, my downstairs neighbor told me to stop vacuuming my flat so late at night. And sometimes, very early in the morning. <laughs> What can I say? My flat's very dusty, okay? <laughs> but the ads for the clit annihilator promised me an orgasm as catastrophic and destructive as the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and there would be no survivors. <laughs> I thought that sounded delightful. I was like, yes, click, drag to basket. She will pay for next day delivery. <laughs> Turns out my clit's a very simple woman who does not need 16 ways to be blasted off my body. <laughs> Settings one to three would have been enough. But I felt the need to justify the purchase of this thing because I dropped a lot of money on it. So I did what any single woman would do, living on her own. And what I did was, I had a date night for myself in the Clit Annihilator. <laughs> and let me tell you, you have not lived until you've seduced yourself by putting on some 90s R&B, lighting some candles, and preparing a nice post-orgasm charcuterie board. <laughs> That's a charcuterie board for one. And then just totally gone to town on yourself with what can only be described as the Tesla of vibrators. Now, the clit annihilator did scare me the other night. Yes, I am still talking about it. Um, you've got to talk about what you know. I went out with some work friends and I came home feeling a little like tipsy, right? Just like a little buzz. And I decided to go all the way with the clit annihilator. That's setting 16. <laughs> now, when I hit 16, I might as well have hit a big red turbo button. Because this thing sounded like it was trying to break the sound barrier. <laughs> it was so powerful. It gave me heart palpitations. I thought I was having a heart attack and that I was going to die. And then I thought, what a way to go. <laughs> Dead in my bed, Clint and I are still buzzing. This thing's got a great battery life. It's like an old Nokia. It will not die. My downstairs neighbor would wonder why I was vacuuming the flat for so long, so she'd call emergency services. They'd have to run up into my flat, break into my bedroom, pull back the weighted blanket. <clears throat> I'd be in bed like Winnie the Pooh, tops on, bottoms off, <laughs> belly out, hand in the honey pot. <laughs> and then at my funeral, my poor sister would have to walk up to the podium to the Macarena <laughs> and say some stupid shit like, well, at least she died doing what she loved. <laughs> Oh man, those were the four points. Do we remember them? We had name, tone of voice, target audience, visually. Okay, there was no one joining. <laughs> I was like, this is my big moment. All right, cool. It's all right. But guess what? We've actually unlocked one more secret stop on the brand adventure. And that point is honesty. Because in writing the show, what I learned is for your brand to be successful, it needs to be authentic in what it's selling and who it is, right? And I've been a little guilty in the past of being dishonest about my brand to kind of make my brand, my life make sense to other people, right? I'll give you an example. Like, I mean, I did have like a fake identity for like two years. <laughs> Tee <-hee. laughs> um, When I was 22, I went to Atlanta to go to an advertising school and I flew using my dad's air miles and because he's MI5, right? I uh, got bumped up to business class, right? And when I was there, the flight attendant offered me champagne, right? I don't know what came over me. I think, I don't know, just flying business class, and I was 21 or 20, yeah, I was 22, and I was afraid that she would hear my accent and ask for ID, and the only ID I had was a British passport. So I just put on an English accent, and she was so nice to me. Treated me like a princess the whole flight. I was like, British Bronwyn demands respect, okay? <laughs> then I landed in Atlanta. I don't know if any of you have ever flown to the US before. You know, US immigration can be a bit intense, right? There's like eagles flying everywhere, Star Spangled Banners playing out of all the speakers. You know, in England, we've got signs that say, see it, say it, sorted, right? In America, it just says, shoot them. Right? So I was very scared traveling on my own. 
I got to passport control and there was a big guy with a mullet and he had a tattoo that said freedom ain't free. And I was all overwhelmed. I thought he would see my like level two terrorism hair, hear my accent, get all sorts of confused. So I just kept the English accent and he was so nice to me. He was like, stamp my passport. And he's like, welcome to America, little lady. And I was like, thank you so much, ta-ta. <laughs> And I got to my school and I had memories of moving to Florida and not fitting in, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, I can't go through all that again. So I just kept the English accent for two years. <laughs> for two years I had to live that lie, right? Did not think it through at all. I remember thinking when I graduated, well, at least I'll never see these people again. In the future, I will not pursue a second career that has me posting videos of myself talking out loud to be beamed across the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest failed rebrand of all time. A bit like when 1982, Colgate actually released a line of frozen dinners. Did we know this? Yeah, Google that, right? Colgate lasagna. I think the tagline was, whose idea was this? <laughs> I didn't stay on the dating apps in the end either. Uh, I got tired of fucking too much. No, um, if anything, not enough, okay? Didn't want to stay on the dating apps. I didn't want to stay on an app that would try to reduce my life down to kind of three shit prompts conceived by a bunch of like bots in Silicon Valley, right? Because the real thing that I've learned in writing this show is that my life may not look like I thought it would. My brand may not be anything that I thought it would be at 37. But the important thing is, is it doesn't have to be. You know, your life doesn't have to make sense because we are humans, we are not brands, we are not products, and we don't need to sell ourselves to anyone, right? I don't think. Do we all agree with that? Yeah, I know. I know. Well, you gotta ask for like a reaction. You don't deserve it. <laughs> I'm like, right, everyone? Clap for me. No. <laughs> no, 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 <sorry. laughs> no, no, it's crazy because, you know, I think about myself and I know that my life doesn't make sense and I'm like, I'm just me, right? I'm just a second sibling, astrology believing, crystal having, football loving, advertising, accent changing, third culture, you know, a happy, horny, death obsessed, child free, happy woman. It just rolls off the tongue so easily. <laughs> You know, and I believe it was the great French chanteuse, Edith Piaf, who sang that I have no regrets. Do we know that song? <laughs> no, je ne regrette rien. That song is like an anthem for me. I really like the bit where she sings about not regretting staying in and wanking all day and eating cheese. Um, <laughs> it just sounds so much better in French. <laughs> but I think about 13-year-old Bronwyn who thought she was gonna die in a Bob the Builder sleeping bag. And I think if she could see us now, she'd be so happy, right? Like, not married with eight kids like her ancestors, but living on her own, eating cheese, hanging out with the clit annihilator, you know? <laughs> I'd say that's winning, okay? And you know, since I've had panic attacks since I was 13, I've had a lot of time to think about my death and my funeral. And when I was 13, I just wanted like a classy affair, right? I just wanted to be buried in a Del Piero jersey, holding a Backstreet Boys uh, picture, <laughs> while my heart will go on played on a harp, right? Just, you know, really easy, classy, classy affair. But now I told you the theme of my funeral is horny, right? I want everyone to hold vibrators up to the sky at full blast. I want flags to be at half mast, dicks to be at full mast, right? It'll be like the horniest event of the century. And I thought in conclusion to the show, I could read that little file on my desktop. Oh bitch, you wary. Here it is. This is actually on my desktop, on my work desktop actually. <laughs> Bronwyn Brown Sauce, Cleona Del Piero, passed away chaotically in her sleep. In a world first, death by vibrator. Her sister is eternally grateful to the EMT men who discovered her body and pulled her pants up, <laughs> giving her the dignity in death she so clearly could not find in life. Her fun Earl trademark, was a confusing event. <laughs> with her family wondering who the front two rows of devastatingly handsome young men were. <laughs> Football legend Alessandro Del Piero was invited to the event, but his PR rep replied, who dis? <laughs> Didn't we follow a restraining order against her? As per her wishes, her ashes were displayed in a novelty honeypot and shot out of a cannon to R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly, <laughs> which was a confusing song choice given the circumstances. <laughs> Her funeral playlist, Death Jams, can be found exclusively on Spotify. And now a reading from the book of Mark Andrews, AKA Cisco. You like to dance all the hip hop spots. You cruise the cruise, like connect the dots. Not just urban, she liked the pop cause she was living la vida loca. She had dumps like a truck, 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 thighs like what? 
What? What? Maybe but, 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 but. I think I'll sing it again. She had dumps like a truck. Truck, truck. Thighs like what? 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 All night long. Let me see that thong. All right, well, that's the show. Um, we got there. We got there in the end. I told you. Um, genuinely, on a very personal note, this isn't funny. I, I really did mean it when I said that after Beanie Babies, time is our most valuable currency. And, and I know we started late, but I, I, I am so grateful for all of you who came out tonight, gave me your love and your energy. Like I said, this is late for me, too, so fuck knows how you guys are doing it. Um, thank you for the bottom of my heart for being here. Um, I've been Brown Sauce. Follow me online. Let's talk now. Um, reductive catchphrase. Good night. Yeah.